the Old Testament reading is Numbers 22, verses 1 through 10, 12. I invite you to stand and read God's Word. Here now we're reading God's Word. Then the people of Israel set out and encamped in the plains of Moab and Isaac and Jordan and Jericho and Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that all that Israel had done, all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people, because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This Lord will now lift up all that is around the mountains, as the ox lifts up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was the king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Baor, at Bethel, which is near the river, in the land of Ammon, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, the people has come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come curse them for me. Perhaps I should be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May God's blessing be upon us. And may God protect us from the enemy who would try to steal this word from us. Amen. It has been something of a challenge to read as we've been reading through Genesis and then Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. And specifically Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers as we talk about the people of Israel moving out of bondage in Egypt to the promised land. And if you've ever taken time to look at a map um, of where Egypt is and the promised land is, um, you wonder why it took 40 years to get there. Um, I heard a joke one time that if a woman was leaving, it would have been much faster because she would have asked for corrections. Um, may be true, but I, I think there's more to it than just not knowing the direction. But if you do look at a map, instead of going from Egypt right across to the Promised Land, they kind of went on this circuitous kind of roundabout route. They seem to take their time along the way of coming from Egypt to the Promised Land. And I don't think it was a lack of directions. I really do believe that it was part of, part of what God's calling was for them in helping them to become God's people that they had to take this journey and they had to take some time along this journey of, to become who they were supposed to be, to, to lead bondage and become a new, a new people under, under God's calling. Um, we know that because at the end of Numbers, the people that left Egypt, of all the people that left Egypt, only two got to go into the promised land. Not even Moses, not one of them. Only two got to go. Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them couldn't go. So there's something more about this journey than being lost. They had to go around so they could become. They had to go around and appreciate each step of the journey. And it's hard for us in this day and time because if you travel, if you choose to travel, you can go just about anywhere you want in no time at all. You have cars and interstate highways. You can travel the distance from Egypt to Israel and Day's journey in a really nice car if the roads were straight. We could, we could make that happen. Not much sleep, but you could do it. Um, I was just thinking about some of the, the travels we've taken as a family. I've, I've driven um, to California and back in three weeks. 
I mean, we, we, that's thousands of miles. That's six, seven times longer than, than what the people of Israel had to do. So there has to be something going on in this story more than just the people of Israel got lost along the way and they finally made it to the promised land. And I do, I believe it's about God helping them to truly claim the promise when they get to it. And even during this time of Lent, we're taking what we call the 40 days of Lent as we prepare for Easter. Recognizing that as a church, we have to be careful about not going so quickly from the birth of Jesus at Christmas and the celebration of Christmas right to the resurrection of, on Easter. We just can't go from one to the other. We need to prepare ourselves and our hearts. And as a church, we need to get ready for this celebration um, by what we call penitent living and self-sacrifice <coughs> of letting go of some of the things that hold us back. For the people of Israel, they had to let go of what it meant to live as a slave under the rule of Pharaoh and to move to living under the rule of God's will for their lives. For them, it took 40 years. For us, we're asking for 40 days. And along any of our journeys, if it's, a, if it's traveling across the country, if it's taking a 40-day journey to, to land, if it's the people of Israel moving around, there were certainly along the way what I like to call diversions. And diversions aren't necessarily bad. Um, one of the things when we travel is that I can be easily diverted by the oddities called roadside America. If, there, if I could ever find that biggest ball of twine, I'm pulling over the sea. Um, I'm not sure where it is, but I, I want to go there. Um, if I see the statue for the biggest Superman, I'm going. Jolly Green Giant, I'm there. I cut across six lanes in Iowa last year to go to the world's largest truck stop. Um, but I didn't want to miss that. That's a diversion, though. And on these diversions, you can find great things and, and wonderful experiences that, that really do help um, us claim the journey that we're on. If I don't take time for that, I have no idea how Spam is made at the Spam Museum. But there's great things along the way that kind of take us just a little bit off the path. And I think diversions in and of themselves can and should be very good and a part of that journey because they help us to slow down and to, to smell the proverbial roses that are out there and to not just be so worried about our destination. Because when we get caught up in the destination, we lose track of what's important. And what's important is becoming the people of God. Now, on a family vacation, it's becoming a family. As a, as a Lenten journey for a church, it's something becoming a church that God would have us be. So what I'm talking about this morning is not diversions, but distractions. Where diversions can, can enlighten and help and help grow the, the journey and draw us closer to one another, distractions do the opposite. Distractions work against every purpose that we're about. It works against getting to the destination, it works against fulfilling a promise. It works against us being together as God's people. Distractions are not good. They're distracting. They keep us from our purpose. In today's scripture lesson, we read about a, a, a people of Moab who are afraid because the people of Israel are great and they see what kind of power they have and they see how strong they are and they see that they're blessed. And so the, the king sends out his son, Balak, to go and find a prophet to fix this thing for them, to, to go and remove that blessing from God's people. So Balak goes to Balaam, who is a prophet for hire. A prophet for hire. Um, he, he, and I would imagine that prophets for hire weren't that much different than they are now. Prophets for hire generally told the people what they wanted to hear. That was probably their first goal, was to tell the people what they wanted to hear. A prophet for hire would do that. Nobody wants to go and get a fortune told or go and talk to somebody and hear bad news. So my guess is, is that most of the time when people went to, to Balaam, they got the news they wanted to get. And as a prophet for hire, he could do that. I like to take him a step further and, and almost call him, he's more like a professional know-it-all. That he knew everything about everything. And he could do this because his very name presents itself, Balaam. It, it literally means somebody who is connected to no people. He's not connected. He's a free agent. 
His very name means he's a free agent. But he also had, some, he had a, at least a canny ability or an uncanny ability to look out over the landscape of the land and say, here's what's happening, here's what's going to happen. And at least he had a sense about how the world worked. So he was paying attention because he had time to pay attention because he was a man with no people. Interestingly enough, Balak was the same thing. His word is just another play on that same word. He's a, he's a king almost with no people. He's a king with, with no power. He sends his son, he sends other people out. There are these people with no power who are trying to bring him into Israel. And this is the beginning. This, this isn't so much at, at this point a distraction for Israel. Because Israel doesn't really know this is happening at this point. But this is the beginning of those distractions of thinking that somebody out there is out to get us. Out to keep us down. Out to keep us from God's promise. And certainly there are people out there that are out to keep us from God's promise. But the good news is, the really good news is, is that we're blessed. And we have, the promise has been made by God and that promise has not been pulled back. So Balak goes to Balaam and Balaam is waiting and God comes to Balaam and I don't know if God came to Balaam a lot. Um, I like to think this is one of the few times he actually had any conversation with God. And we know from other stories about Balaam, he's not always paying close attention to how God's working in his life. At one point, his own, his own donkey has to hear God's work for him and speak to him. But we know that Balaam's not always connected to God closely. But at this point, God comes and says, leave these people, people of Balak, sons of Zippor, people from Moab, leave them because you're, I'm not with them. I'm with the other God. And they are blessed. So verse 12 says, they are blessed. They are blessed. And I believe it happens in life sometimes as we, as we become God's people. And this is God's people, Israel, becoming God's people, almost about to go into the promised land. And it's the beginning of the distractions of those who will try to stand against us and keep us from fulfilling God's promise in our lives. For ourselves, for our church, for our community, we are God's people called to do God's work. And oftentimes what we do is we allow the distractions of life to turn us away from what God is calling us to do. We, we create boogeymen out there who will say, no, you can't do this. No, this is not allowed. And we forget that God has called us into very particular things to go and make disciples. To go out into the world to share the good news. And there's no boogeyman, there's no agency, there's no institution that can shackle our hearts and keep us from doing what we have been called to do. And that's good news, people. That's really good news. And, and that's not good enough historically, even when those institutions seem to be winning. Even when those boogeyman distractions are seeming to put us down as a church or a people. Throughout history, a church that is under siege and under fire, a church that is persecuted, is a stronger church. It's been that way for history. It's that way today. You go to China, you aren't allowed to be a Christian. It's against the law. Thousands of people are coming each day into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can't allow those that we think are persecutors or are actually persecuted to take away and put us in a bondage hold us back from our call. Those are distractions along the journey. We have been called to be God's people. The people of Israel, at this point, they were getting it. They understood it. Now we'll read on. We'll see where they miss it every once in a while. You look at the history of this church. You look at the history of the Methodist church. There's points when we really got it, and there's points when we don't get it. And there's times when we're strong, and there's times when we're weak. But we're strongest when we're recognizing that we're blessed. That God has blessed us and God has called us and that nothing can stop us. Not the false prophet, not the professional know-it-all, not the person who thinks they have all the answers because the only one that has all the answers is God. God is calling us forward. God is calling us to His promise and God is looking for us, away, for us, to, looking for us to say yes to the yes that He has already given. Yes, the promised land is yours. Yes, the promise of Jesus Christ is yours. Do not be distracted on the journey. Do not be distracted. Do not be distracted by the Balaam who have no people. 
and the Balaam to the Ethiopian. God is calling you to great things. On your journey, it may take 40 years. It may take 400 years. But when you get there, you'll know that you have followed God's path. The one that has called us to be together, to be unified, to be God's people, and to claim the promise that he offers us from day one. Genesis 1, he offers us through Revelation to continue to hear that promise. All we have to do is claim it for ourselves today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.